Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all so much for this online version of our annual Business and Economics Women's Lunch. I'm Sophie Thomas, and I am the host of the faculty's podcast, Women Are the Business, uh, which explores women's working lives and features some of our amazing alumni and expert academics. Um, I'm delighted to be partnering with our alumni relations team to bring you today's discussion on how these unusual times have affected women. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would like to acknowledge that today is the last day of National Reconciliation Week here in Australia. Um, this last week has been an important time to focus and reflect on our country's history and to pay respect to the First Nations people of Australia as we work towards a more just and equitable nation. Uh, today and always, we pay our respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, both past and present. So to kick things off, I'll just do a little bit of an introduction of these uh, three women you're looking at. Um, so first off, we have the wonderful Madeline Grummet, who is in some nice fuchsia pink today. Uh, <laughs> Madeline is an entrepreneur. She's the co-founder of two very successful startup companies, Girl World and Future Amp, which are edtech platforms. Uh, she was actually the recipient of this year's Business and Economics Alumni of Distinction Leadership Award. Uh, so welcome along, Madeline. Uh, Madeline's joined by Libby Lyons, who uh, is also an alumni of the University of Melbourne, um, and she's a director of the Australian Government's Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Uh, prior to joining the agency, Libby uh, had a distinguished career in corporate affairs and government relations. Um, and so in her current role as the director of the agency, she's focused on working closely with businesses all over Australia to achieve gender equality. And then our last panel member in black uh, is Jen Overbeck. Uh, so she's one of our fantastic associate professors here at Melbourne Business School. Uh, she is an internationally recognised expert on power, status, hierarchy and negotiation particularly. Um, so she's done a lot of research on how organisations change and uh, the way that different leaders appro approach power. So we're delighted to have these wonderful women with us uh, to chat about COVID-19 and how it's impacting women's working lives. Uh, to kick things off, I think I actually would like to direct my first question to Libby. Um, so the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, for those of you who don't know, um, more than, so every, every company in Australia with more than 200 employees has to actually report into this agency as to how they're tracking when it comes to gender equality. So I imagine that Libby's been having some really fascinating conversations with businesses all over the country as to how they're navigating coronavirus and especially in the context of gender equality. Um, so Libby, in your mind, um, how do you think COVID-19 has impacted the working lives of women? Thanks so much, Sophie. And just one thing, it's um, organisations in the private sector with more than 100 employees reporting to us on an annual basis. So we collect census data from roughly just over 11,000 organisations in Australia. I think there have been a number of ways in which women have been impacted by this pandemic. Um, the one that is attracting the most attention at the moment is the fact that uh, more women than men have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. Um, ABS figures in April showed that um, 325,000 women had lost their jobs compared to 269,000 men. So women are, are certainly at the forefront there, unfortunately. Um, a lot of this is because women in Australia work part-time at three times the rate of men. Uh, they're all, they also work casually, in casual employment more than men. And of course, in times of uh, hardship, whether it be a health crisis or an economic crisis, uh, it is often uh, those part-time and casual roles that we see um, are lost or hours reduced. So this is one of the reasons why um, we've seen more women lose their jobs. The other issue here is that, um, which is a positive in some ways, is that, of course, the people fighting this pandemic, the people on the front line of this pandemic, have largely been women as well. If you look at the essential services that we've needed um, through this health crisis, uh, it's been people in the healthcare and social assistance sector, nurses, carers, 
uh, pathologists, radiologists, all of those sorts of uh, health providers and, and allied providers, um, they are predominantly women. Healthcare is, uh, is a female dominated industry with 80% of its employees being women. The other essential services have of course been education, teaching and early childhood education and again a female dominated industry. So women have been at the fore of fighting this pandemic but that's added an extra burden of worry to them, of mental stress, of bringing the illness home to their families. But on top of this, many of them have had to also juggle homeschooling, uh, looking after children that have been at home and also caring for loved ones who may have been ill and needed extra care. So, uh, you know, this, this increased uh, burden of care on women has been huge as well. And I think the other thing that I'm very concerned about is the longer economic uh, security of women. Um, and the, the government announced that uh, people could actually access their superannuation, uh, some superannuation should they need it in times of financial hardship. AMP came out just yesterday and said that their statistics showed that more women were accessing their superannuation than men. This is a real worry to me because women, um, their, their superannuation balances are far less than men's and what we are seeing is uh, women's superannuation accounts actually closing because they're having to withdraw funds to see them through. So it's been a quadruple whammy on women really, I think, and, uh, and you know, there are some bright things that have come out of this, but there are also many, many things that we need to take into account, particularly as we move into a, an economic recovery phase. Fantastic, thank you, Libby. Um, now, I'm really interested in hearing from Madeline as a business owner and an entrepreneur, what the experience of this uh, COVID-19 lockdown has been for you when, when it comes to managing your team, but also keeping two businesses alive um, and also raising four children. What has that experience been like for you? Yeah, um, I'll use your words, Libby. I have a quadruple whammy that I live with. Uh, I have four daughters. Uh, so it's certainly been an interesting time, like many parents um, adapting to what it looks like to both uh, have you know, people working and learning from home. I'm going to pick up on the first part of your question and talk mainly around entrepreneurship and businesses um, during this context. So I think um, if we think about entrepreneurship, like the definition is to create something under conditions of extreme uncertainty. So as a startup or an entrepreneur, you're always in a, a climate of volatility to a certain extent. What we know is that through COVID, that's become even more um, accelerated and that we've seen a really big dent to fund access to funding for entrepreneurs, particularly for female founded companies. Uh, we know currently around the world, uh, female founders only access around about 3% of, of venture capital and that has dropped during COVID. So that is a problem. Um, we also know that the market dynamics are incredibly volatile uh, at the moment and so therefore for startups to really um, be able to sort of plan ahead and project you know, pathways to market, that's become really quite difficult um, for them, especially where they're relying on um, existing enterprise um, for customer access. So um, shout out to all the founders out there, keep going. And uh, if your runway is short, then just see if you can ride it out. Um, we know the government's uh, put some great incentives in place with, with JobKeeper and some other incentives to try and give cash bonuses to business. Um, but it's really important that we keep as many startups alive as possible to keep growing this thriving ecosystem that we have in Victoria. And, um, and Startup Vic certainly um, and Launch Vic are doing a lot in that area. So I'm really hoping we can, we can pull through. Um, I wrote an article recently sort of reflecting on this time that we're living through. And um, one of the quotes that I started that with was from um, Victor Frankl, uh, who wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And he said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think all of us across the planet have felt quite helpless, especially in recent days, looking at what's playing out in America right now. And if these sort of last fraught months of the Humanity 4.0 show, sort of a horror show, have taught us anything, it's that in times of great constraint, we're actually capable of remarkable shifts. So we've seen quite a lot of um, adaptation occurring in business. We've seen a lot of Sort of new business opportunities emerge and other sectors, of course, like hospitality, really struggling under a constrained market. Um, but we've seen education and business reshaping itself. So we think about how we're communicating now. Uh, and governments, of course, scrambling to problem solve on the fly. So, so amongst all the devastation, we're also seeing some remarkable acts of innovation occurring 
uh, with out of the box policy and a reprogramming of money across the economy. And I think these are all uh, positive signs that humans are in fact very resilient and that despite the challenges we're facing collectively, um, they will find a way through all of this. Um, one of the big uh, things that, uh, that occurs to me, and I reckon it's probably best to um, tell a bit of a story to set the frame for this, and I'd love everyone listening in to think about their own changes that have occurred through um, these recent months as have all been faced with the challenges to our daily work and lives. There was a great um, story that was told by a guy called David Wallace in a commencement speech for a university in about 2005. And he tells this story of these two, uh, David was an essayist and a novelist, and he tells this story about these two young fish who were swimming along, just happily swimming along side by side, and this other older fish comes swimming toward them. And he nods at them and he says, morning boys, how's the water? And the fish sort of look at each other and keep swimming on for a bit, and then eventually one fish turns to the other quite confused and says, what the hell is water? And I think that story illustrates that his point was most of us sort of wander through life not really conscious or woke, you know, to the daily choices that we are making. We're sort of in this trench default around our work or our choices in our, in our families around that division of labour. And I think that COVID's given us all the chance to rethink our choices, to sort of get a little bit more conscious around how is it that we choose to show up in our, in our workplace, what sort of work is meaningful to us, and how do we actually balance those of us who have families, that enormous currency of care that often goes unhidden, and Libby, I'm sure you could build on this a thousand times. Um, and so for me, I think it's been a really interesting period to run two startups uh, from home. I found it actually easier, it's more flexible. I can work to my energy levels or my family commitments. I can also co-parent for the first time in a long time uh, with my partner because we're both at home and so we can really divide that labour. Um, and from a team point of view inside my companies, um, it's been a chance to see inside people's lives. Say, who are you actually? I can actually get a window to your world, a window to the human, and start to see people for the humans they are and not just the workers they are. So I found it uh, a really fascinating renaissance of sorts, um, acknowledging also the hardship that has occurred out in the community for those who have lost jobs and livelihoods. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to see how workplaces are shifting and I think that's where Jen can provide some really valuable insights. Um, so Jen, I'm wondering now that for many people, I mean, it's not everyone, but for many people, home has become our workplace. I'm wondering what the implications of that are in your mind. Um, thanks. And let me say uh, before I start that I, we have some construction going across the street, so I want to apologize in advance if there's some distracting uh, percussion behind what I say. Um, so in terms of implications, there are implications for the workplace, for our jobs and our organizations. And there are implications for home as well. And I think, um, so a colleague and I just uh, wrote an article that I hope will be coming out in about a week saying, really in terms of the workplace, I don't think we know what we can extract yet from this time. Um, this has been about the worst possible experience in work from home or, or experiment in work from home. So there's, there are, really at this point, decades of good research on how work from home works, and we know that it can um, be associated with really high morale, really good motivation, good creativity, good productivity. And then as long as there's a kind of a minimal period of time in which people and organizations can be face to face, which some research suggests maybe on order about two days a week, like ideally we would see each other for a couple of days a week, but then really spending up to three days at home doing our work can be a very productive, very positive thing for everybody. But that's assuming we're just working from home. That's assuming that we're not doing childcare, we're not having to take care of all of our meals, do all of our own cleaning, work out at home, um, and do all of that potentially with a number of other people who are trying to do this um, package of activities in the same space. So uh, what are the implications? I hope one of the implications is that organizations, um, as we're hearing, a lot of organizations are pleasantly surprised by how well workers have risen to the challenge, that they have really stepped up and been more agile than usual, more innovative, willing to take risks, 
And much of this may be because there was a pandemic and things were scary and people do step up and take risks at such times. Um, but I think some of that might be able to carry over. And what I'm hoping organizations do is respond um, not by rushing back into doing things the way that they were, but by easing in in such a way that we can see what's valuable from this. What can we use that will actually help and nourish people once this period of a lot of stress and strain and disruption starts to ease? Beautiful. Thank you. And I think that's something that a lot of people are thinking about is now that lockdowns are starting to ease, um, if we are just going to snap back to normal or if things are going to change, is this a fork in the road? Are we going to just go back to the way things were or are things really going to shift for our working lives? Um, I want to actually open that question to all of you and just see, ask if you think that this is going to be a big turning point or if we're just going to do what humans do, which is go back to what's comfortable. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take that first up. I absolutely hate this snap back term. Um, I don't think we want to snap back. I understand that we want the economy to snap back uh, and I understand why that term came about. But I think we need to leap forward. We need to snap forward, however you want to describe it. This is an opportunity for us to actually look at the way we work and the way we live. And I think that the wonderful thing that's come out of this pandemic with people who have been fortunate enough to maintain their jobs and to be working differently is that employers have, many employers have for the first time um, discovered that they can actually trust their employees to work away from the office, to not be sitting at a desk in the office and still get their job done and still achieve the outcomes that an employer requires. And I think this, is, this has been a wonderful example of how one aspect of flexible work can uh, benefit an employer. So I think we need to leap forward and we, and we need employers to now uh, look at how they can really normalise flexible work in their workplaces and that's not just working from home. And bear in mind, working from home was never meant to be a five-day-a-week thing for weeks on end. Um, there are all sorts of other ways of flexible work. It's it, looking at start and finish times for shifts, split shifts, uh, all of those different sorts of things. And I think when I listen to governments talk now, we're going to have to look at staggered starts and different start and finish times for our workplaces in, uh, so that we can all start getting public transport back to work again while social distancing continues. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to embrace flexible work, to understand that if we recognise that employees have responsibilities and accountability outside their working life and enable employees to balance these things, that actually workplaces will become um, happier, employees will be more engaged, more loyal, more productive, and actually that makes for a better organisation, that you'll have a better bottom line, a more creative organisation, you'll be ahead of your, your, your um, competitors who have not embraced flexible work and all of these other things that we know are important. So I think that uh, this crisis has definitely proved beyond reason, beyond any doubt at all, that certainly working from home um, is, is feasible and achievable, but that flexible work in general needs to be embraced. And if you embrace it, then you're going to be smart and you're going to be ahead of your game. Libby, I, I agree entirely and I'd love to build on some of what you've said and that is that I think you highlighted a really important point. It's not that we just replace one with the other, working from home with five days in the office. What we've actually seen is an acceleration to, to agile and, and Jen, you use that word earlier and startups of course work like this all the time but what has been significant is that whether kicking or screaming and screaming or not most workers have had to move um, to a really different looking kind of work style and that includes um, you know working asynchronously 
often. Uh, it can include working, as you say, based on output. So let's, what, what does it look like if we shift to sort of a, a value rather than a time-based metric around our work, which doesn't look like nine to five? And then, of course, this critical shift around the authenticity that we've seen occur, whereby you're no longer just a worker, but you're a real person first. And, um, and that's enormous. And, and I think, um, you know, for companies to create this shift, it has to happen at a policy level, but it has to happen at a, at a cultural level too, to say, we do trust that, that this person will do the job they're asked to do, but in a way that works for them and on a time flow that works for them with respect to the team dynamic. And um, I think companies like Atlassian have been talking about this for a long time and going deep, you know, into that team level health and really trying to understand how to optimise high performance. And what we've shown is we've got multiple case studies right now um, that have shown us that it's very possible to work like that. We need to rethink the role of an institutional hierarchy or organisational structure in respect of this shift. Indeed. You're quite right. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll jump on with respect a little bit to kind of the psychology of how people respond to change. Um, I think this has been a really great experiment and we, uh, it, having just said it was a terrible experiment, it's been great for us to be thrown out of our normal and have the experience of doing something very different. Um, that's been fantastic. I don't think it has gone on long enough for new habits and new expectations to take root. And one thing that I think is a big caution with regard to women in particular, as these transitions to not entirely work from home start to happen, is that um, all of this was prompted by a pandemic and it, it created enormous disruption. And for kids and families in particular, there's been a lot of disruption. I think it's very reasonable to expect that in coming months, those people who have kids at home are going to see those kids having some after effects of this experience. And they may need quite a lot of care and quite a lot of attention. Uh, there may be even more of a, a, a burden or a duty of care that happens within the home. And we know from lots of research that it is typically the um, woman in the home, if, if it's a heterosexual couple, who ends up taking on the majority of that kind of responsibility. And I think that sort of coupled with um, the disruption for men, you know, men's socialization is very much around uh, caring and providing and breadwinning and that sort of thing. And it would not be surprising if many men feel going back to work that they are operating in a deficit, that they have lost ground to make up, and that they can't afford to be seen giving you know less than 100% in the workplace. Those kinds of forces might combine to put women in a situation where they feel no choice but to be focusing more attention toward home needs and that pulls them away from some of those workplace things. And that puts them right back in the position that we've seen, again, from decades of research, where the attributions that companies make about how men and women will spend flexible time are different, where men are given the benefit of the doubt, oh, if he needs flex time, he must be working on a really exciting project. And if a woman needs flex time, she's probably wasting it on taking care of the family. So uh, I think we need to do this really intentionally and very consciously and be quite aware of these impulses in ourselves as well as these cultural dynamics, such as what Madeline just mentioned about organizations. Yeah, and one of the cultural dynamics is that we have a term working mum, but we don't really use the term working dad. A good point. Um, we've had a question come through our Q&A function, which I think is actually really interesting and not something that I've seen people really discussing. Um, we've proven that we can really do our jobs uh, from home in a lot of industries, but something that I know is really particularly important in the entrepreneurship and startup space, Madeline, is the concept of networking, not within just your own industry, but beyond. Um, how can people maintain their networks? in a time like this? And how have you navigated that yourself? It's a great question. And yes, uh, in entrepreneurship, they say your, your network is your net worth. Um, so um, in my case, uh, look, I think LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, it it ha always has been and it always will as a place where you can meet like-minded professionals. You know, you can reach out to people there or join groups to keep, uh, keep up with conversation or where's the zeitgeist sort of moving. Um, so I think LinkedIn's one area. You can, of course, create, I mean, I've been part of a bunch of think tanks just on Zoom and they've been amazing because there's people who've been in the Zoom room 
who I wouldn't otherwise have connected with. So some that's another way to do it is to kind of get groups of people together around uh, you know certain ideas that you're exploring, uh, and of course location is not a barrier. Whereas in the past we wouldn't have thought to connect in this way. That's uh, another way to do it. Um, and I, I've been very fortunate that one of the companies, um, Future Amp, is inside and accelerate at the moment called Future Minds, which is a David Gonski backed. Um, ed tech accelerator um, and so through that um, as part of our accelerator kind of cohort we've had connections to people all over APAC um, and that's enabled us to plug in those you know in startups you're always trying to plug in people who know more than you which is lots of people uh, to get that little piece of um, you know business advice or acumen to plug in at the right time to accelerate your path to market and so uh, I've been fortunate on those counts, but outside a structure of an accelerator, certainly LinkedIn or using your existing networks um, to see if you can reach out, you know, across the ripples in the pond is a good way to think about it. Beautiful. I'd like to speak to that too, just from an organizational uh, perspective. Um, there's this concept when we think about organizations and how you develop influence within organizations of earning credit. And the idea is that when you do things that demonstrate your competence and when you demonstrate that you're really part of the group, you earn credits. And as you amass, I mean, this is essentially the concept of social capital, right? Um, you amass these credits. It's like a bank account. And then as your account gets bigger and bigger, then that gives you the ability to start spending and you spend on being able to influence somebody or being able to ask for something or being able to have your, your proposal given more serious consideration, whatever the case may be. So I think even when we're operating remotely, it's really useful to think about what am I doing to top up my credit balance? What am I doing that demonstrates my competence in some way? So I'm an academic. Some of the things that I can do are participate in webinars or uh, write articles, um, share expertise, teach classes. You know, those are all things that help um, not only give me an exercise for competence, but also to help make that competence visible. But then the group membership too. What am I doing for a group that matters to me? What am I doing for other people in a way that matters to me? This is kind of a nice way to take women's natural, I mean, on average, um, natural socialization to really be attending to and attuned to other people and use that to, to help build our own strength and to help build our own power. And what that would mean in a workplace is what am I doing to contribute to a team that maybe I'm not part of and maybe I don't need today, but maybe six months, 12 months down the road, maybe I might have a reason to need to engage with that team. Could I be doing something right now that helps that team out, that assists them. And that's professional development for me, but it's also putting credit in the bank, helps me maintain that visibility. And so you, you can start to think, and I know everything's so busy, it's hard to have that long-term thinking. This is another reason it would be great for us to keep working from home a while after the kids go back to school and some of those um, burdens ease. But what can I be doing right now to use this as an opportunity to build, to build for the future? And I think there are lots of ways we can do that. Right, and I think you touched on something there um, that I think a lot of people have been thinking about at the moment, which is um, the way that men and women have been socialised differently and how that's sort of come to the forefront in the pandemic. And uh, that's why I would really like for uh, Libby to touch on some of the work that the agency has been doing when it comes to occupational segregation. Um, and as Libby mentioned, a lot of the people who are doing the essential work and aren't working from home, uh, they're women, they're teachers, they're nurses, um, you know, they're working at nursing homes. Um, Libby, can you talk us through some of that research that you guys have done and also what you think this uh, situation is going to mean for these highly gendered industries? It's an interesting one, Sophie. So traditionally in Australia, we've had female-dominated industries and male-dominated industries, and 60% um, of us have only ever worked in an industry dominated by women or men. You know, 60% of us work in, a, in an industry that's dominated by women or dominated by men, which is interesting in itself. But in our society, the job that men do the jobs that men do have traditionally been um, have been more highly valued than the jobs that traditionally women have done. So, if you look at uh, you know a, a perfect example here is that you basically need the same sort of educational attainment to be 
a mechanic as you do to be an early childhood educator, early childhood educator and carer. Um, and yet mechanics get paid on average twice as much as early childhood educators and carers. Why? Um, and, and, and some of it comes down to the fact that the male dominated industries are generally industries that create wealth for the country. Construction, resources, things like that, they create wealth. They're wealth creating industries and wealth creating jobs. The essential services that we found during this pandemic that we cannot live without, that are that are you know at the heart of our sustainability as a community, nurses, early childhood educators, cleaners, aged care workers, uh, pathologists, you know, radiologists, all of those people um, that are essential to, to sustaining our community um, are not, they're not wealth creating areas. They're essential services and yet all of a sudden we couldn't have done without them over the last three months or so. Um, we couldn't have done without them before, but because of this pandemic, it's shone a light on them and said, these really are important jobs. These are essential to our being. So going forward, it's going to be really interesting. And Jen um, uh, made an interesting point earlier that um, we probably haven't been in this situation long enough to it, for it to allow it to make for sustainable change. But I think we've got to work on trying to make it more sustainable. And that is that, that, that the value of these female dominated industries and roles have come to the fore and we've all of a sudden recognised what many of us have known for ages, that these roles are vital and important. But how do we keep the spotlight on them to ensure that they remain that way? And how do we encourage, I mean, if we look at, um, at the future of, of industries and, and, over the, and jobs and the growth of jobs uh, between now and 2030, the ones that are the growth industries, the industries that are growth industries are again the health and aged care sector and the education and training sector. So has this, Will this pandemic change the way men think about moving into those roles? And with many men without jobs now, will they consider retraining, reskilling to move into these industries? And I think that if we can, if we can encourage that and start continue to talk about these jobs as being important jobs and essential roles, um, we may see. Uh, men start changing their attitudes and women about the, 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 these sorts of roles and what they do. So um, I think as we move into the recovery, it's really important that in times of economic recovery, we've always concentrated on nation building projects, infrastructure projects and the like, as we should, because they are the ones, they are the sorts of projects that actually gets the country up and running again and that creates wealth for us and creates jobs and that's important. But we need to ensure that women are absolutely given the choice to re-engage in employment in those industries as well. And we do that by doing things like ensuring that when we're putting out tenders for jobs that we put gender on the tender and that anybody who is tendering for that work must ensure that they have gender balance in their teams that they're putting forward to do the work. We must ensure that um, when we're, you know, coming in on time and on budget for any project is important, but are we putting unrealistic expectations on these projects which mean that employees of these um, that are working on these projects have to work six plus days a week. We can't. That's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the employees. It's not sustainable for employers in the long term. We have to change the way we think, and we've proven that we can create structural change overnight if we have to. Mm -hmm. So now let's take those uh, those learnings forward and make sure that we change the way we think, we work and we engage. Mm. I, I, I love your sentiment, Libby, and I think uh, you touched on this idea of skills 
And this, this, we've had a step change, of course, in the way we perceive value uh, in industries. And as you say, the females at the front line have, you know, been a forefront industry. But also, um, Scott Morrison released in the last, or late last week, around this new skills package around how do we reskill or upskill existing sectors. So um, it will be interesting to see how we move forward and codify some of those shifts that we've seen occur at a policy level, at a structural level, um, and, and really start to rethink how we divide up sectors and, and their benefit, their net benefit um, to wealth creation and, and Australia's future economy. Um, one of the areas we're working very closely inside FutureAmp is trying to skill the next generation, um, of, you know, the students of today for the jobs of tomorrow. And what we know is that Australia is set to reach a skills deficit of about 29 million by 2030. So in other words, there, there literally will not be enough talented people to fill the future industry jobs. Um, so it's time now, it's sort of this wake up call for us to look at what happens. We've lived through this black swan economic event. We can see industry collapsing. We can see a workforce that is not skilled and ready to step into the emerging sectors. Uh, we see globalization, automation, all of these things are affecting the middle band of workforce particularly. And so we really um, have got a chance now to, to think about what that redesign, that recalibration looks like as we move forward into our next economic, hopefully, recovery. Mm. I think too, Madeline, you know, the sort of work that you're doing and female entrepreneurs are key to this as well. You know, starting up a business um, for women is, you know, um, an option that many take because it enables women to do all the other things that we have to do in our lives as well. But of course, as you know, as well as I do, that women are trying to borrow money. It's often much, much harder than it is for men. And is there a role for government in the industry to play here in making it easier for women to borrow money? And women are actually a better bet uh, in lending to anyway because we know that women pay pay their, 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 um, their borrowings back uh, more reliably than men. So mm -hmm. I think we need to even that score as well and we need to recognise that actually women are a very good bet here uh, at, but they just need to be given more of a chance, a chance that men have been able to take advantage of for a long, long time. So we need to even the score there too. We do. Access to capital is a really big problem for women, in, whether that's in SME or in startup. Um, and that's both at an institutional level, not being able to access, you know, sort of bank loans, where all the data shows that men are more likely to get a bank loan over the line. Uh, but it's also inside venture capital uh, networks uh, or even angel networks. Unfortunately, there's a lot of inherent biases, and Jen, no doubt you could talk uh, deeply to this, um, that prevent women from accessing the capital they need to get the runway they need to make their business successful. They will more likely die. Uh, before they get that business to market. Um, one of the encouraging things that's occurred recently, and again, I'll refer to a Victorian move um, by Launch Victoria, is they've set up a funding round to fund more angel networks. And there's a lot more women going into those angel networks. And for those who aren't um, as familiar with sort of the whole venture or funding ecosystem, angels work sort of at the top of the funnel. When startups are a bit too early to get institutional or venture money, but they are a good team and have got good traction or, or a great, uh, you know, idea for market and uh, if they can access that angel capital at the top end they're more li likely to move forward now the good news about having more women inside angel networks is that they're more likely to counter the biases and move toward female founded teams and so you've got these two forces acting together to hopefully push more startups through the funnel to eventual success yeah beautiful um we've had a really some really great questions coming through um one thing in particular that i think is really good from helen is um she says that she's sometimes worried that we limit diversity to gender and that she thinks we all have an obligation to encourage diversity of all kinds especially during and after COVID-19. Um, that's something I think is particularly interesting and um, we did an episode of the Women of the Business podcast with uh, one of our other professors Susan Ainsworth and one of the things that she was concerned about when it came to coronavirus was uh, businesses having to uh, resort to cost cutting and potentially diversity programs being one of the first things to be scrapped. Um, and I'm just wondering, Libby, from your perspective, if that's something that you're concerned about and how do we ensure that diversity is still a priority for businesses as they recover from coronavirus? It, it's a really interesting question because when we released our data, our last set of data in uh, towards the end of last year, there weren't huge movements in any of the gender equality indicators that we measure. There weren't any huge movements in a positive sense. 
Uh, and anecdotally, I was hearing that there was a bit of DNI fatigue out there amongst employees. You can't have fatigue around diversity and uh, inclusion. It is a nonsense. And if organisations think for one minute that we've done diversity and inclusion, uh, they haven't had a good hard look at their workforce in general, most of them. Um, the fact is, uh, interestingly, I am hearing anecdotally through organisations such as Male Champions um, for Change, Male Champions of Change and whatever, that employers now, whilst whilst I feared that many would say uh, we've got to cut costs, oh, d is going to be the first to go, the smart employers like those who sign up for Male Champions of Change and others have recognised that um, their diversity and employment inclusion programs and actually ramping them up and ensuring that their action plans are actually um, are actioned and people are held ac accountable for achieving the results in those action plans um, have actually realised that in, in, in realising the action plans of a diversity and inclusion plan will actually see them ahead of their competitors. So the smart employers are realising that that DNI gender equality, it particularly, but DNI generally, uh, is absolutely the way to go to help them recover and to build their business back up very, very quickly. Um, I just hope that um, other organisations, if they don't continue along with their DNI um, strategies and plans, will realise that they are falling. A lot of fall, falling by the wayside and falling in comparison to their competitors uh, because they've let it la uh, lapse and will pick it up again because we know, we absolutely know that gender balanced teams, diverse teams uh, are absolutely will, will help you build a better, stronger, more sustainable and financial business. So, um, the stuff I'm hearing is positive, but of course there will be other things. I think the other thing that's been really important is the media have jumped onto this. And the media have said, particularly in relation to women, uh, women are over half the population of Australia today. We cannot let half the population down. This is absolutely essential. So we need to keep uh, the media onto this. We need to keep talking about it. Uh, in, in webinars and as researchers and as, as employees and employers and entrepreneurs, we need to keep talking. Uh, women, uh, you know, if we forget half the population of our country as we're moving to a recovery, uh, we are going to be way behind the eight ball in terms of other countries around the world and, and, and our global, um, uh, you know, our global competitiveness. And I'd like to jump in on the aspect of Helen's question where she talked about elements of diversity beyond gender, uh, thinking about things, you know, racial diversity, ethnic diversity. I saw, uh, just flashed over to the chat for a moment and saw the word disability come through. And, you know, there's um, the, the research on the benefits of diversity sometimes can look mixed. There are studies that show diversity having positive effects and studies that appear to show diversity having negative effects. The main thing in, a, in an integrative review and meta-analysis, uh, looking at why do we see these different effects, one of the main things that seems to be responsible for that is the manager's skill at managing a diverse workforce. That managers who are good at managing diversity get much more benefit from a diverse team than they do from a non-diverse team. But those managers who are maybe reluctant or resistant, who knows, maybe they're harboring some bias themselves, um, those managers tend to see worse performance from a diverse team. And I think to some extent this moment gives us a little bit of hope for benefit there because managers are among the people who've been forced to learn new ways of doing things. Simply controlling people's behavior or watching what they're doing in the office and drawing conclusions based on visible cues hasn't been able to cut it over the last few months. People have had to learn how to set objectives and communicate those objectives, how to evaluate performance based on actual results delivered as opposed to patterns of visible behavior in the office, how to communicate and align values among teams and among workers. And I think those are all skills that are probably critical 
to being able to manage diverse teams well. So instead of managing from our point of bias, we manage what we're trying to achieve and then that practice in evaluating results based on the results themselves, that practice might really carry over. So this is something I think is a hopeful a hopeful point that we can take from this experience. You know, it's certainly not guaranteed that we'll have the best outcome, but managers have had to step outside their comfort zone and learn some new skills, and those skills could potentially carry over well to accommodating diversity, even beyond gender diversity. Right. That actually ties in quite well to a really good question we've had from Alison, which is on um, the concept of leadership during this crisis. And I know I've seen uh, hundreds of stories uh, seeing the praises of our female global leaders at this time. Jacinda Ardern is the media's darling. Um, and there has been some commentary sort of supposing that uh, perhaps we, women are just better leaders in a crisis. Um, now, Jen, you are a bit of an expert when it comes to leadership. And I'm wondering what your take on this is. Are women better leaders? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, uh, I don't think there's the simple answer to that. When these memes came out, I loved them on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, they sent me to one of the websites that really aggregates all the international data. And as I looked at where countries led by women fell and the distribution of COVID-related outcomes, it was really not that distinguishable. The one thing we can say is that the very worst countries all seem to be headed by men, but women were not clustered at the positive end. Um, so, so what is it that we're seeing? What is it that people are responding to? I think it's that leadership is, it's about achieving results, but to get to those results, there's a, um, there's an important role for the style and the way that that leader works with people. And we see a couple of kind of paradigms of leadership. One is the strong man, and I use man deliberately there, the strong man style of I'm going to dominate, I'm going to bark orders, I'm going to intimidate, I'm going to, well, I, you can tell by my accent I'm American, so let's just say I'm going to sweep protesters out of the way with tear gas, if that's the kind of strength that I want to show. Um, whereas another style is collaborative and inclusive and listens to people's voices. And what's, what's strong about that is that it harnesses the energy of the collective. It gets everybody on board and really committed to whatever the outcome is. So instead of having to dominate and scare people into doing something, you can inspire them into doing things. And so Jacinda Ardern, I think, you know, one of the things that she's most known for is the Facebook chat where she gets on Facebook and she really speaks directly to people and explains her thinking and explains what's happening in a really chatty and personable way. Now, honestly, I've been immensely impressed with the communications by the Australian government and the Victorian government who have done multiple daily pressers and been very clear and very forthcoming about here are what the data tell us, here's how we're making decisions based on the data, here are the decisions that we've made. And, and that's not necessarily gender bound. So I think what, what we're seeing is that um, the stylistic elements are more likely to be representative of female leadership tendencies. And some of those worst tendencies, really almost no women engage in those tendencies. I mean, they, certainly they do. Uh, almost none of the prominent world leaders right now are engaging in that who are women. I think, the other point, I think the other point we need to make, Jen, is that there are so few female leaders that, uh, of course, they're going to attract attention. That's right. And, and, That's and be, because of that, we are seeing them stand out in terms of the media are picked up because there are so few of them because, by and large, the world's still run by men. Yeah, that's very yep, true. I agree. There's not, like, despite the progress we've made, you know, over the past few decades um, and women have benefited from a growing economy here in, here in Australia, we've still got a long way to go, baby. Uh, you know, as, as Greer said, like, women are still underrepresented in all levels, in all sectors, all there's disproportionate levels of, you know, of women in, in certain areas where they're underpaid, as, as you highlighted, Libby. So I think what's interesting about this is we see, uh, and, you know, we see Trump sort of go ever deeper into demonstrating what leadership does not look like uh, or effective leadership uh, as his country implodes around him. Um, that may, you know, this, this redefining of the paradigm that I think we need to collectively do to think about what does it look like to have leadership that is soft and strong, you know, mm -hmm. like Jacinda Ardern, where you can step up and lead where you need to. But, but ultimately the role of a leader is to create more leaders. I mean, certainly in startups, that's how we think. There's no point being one kind of 
lone wolf at the top, you must work out how you actually encourage the people who are part of your team to step up and replace you. And that's, that's a natural organisational you know, structure that's going to benefit the organisation. So I think you know, it's time for us to think about who do we want to lead us through this very complex time on earth and who's best placed to do that in a way that is, as you say, Jen, collaborative. Yeah. I think one of the, you know, I, I too believe that uh, Australia, both the state and state, territory and federal governments have done a fantastic job through this pandemic. Uh, there've been there've been some women and men there at, at the table. I think one of the positive things to come out of this has been the national cabinet. Uh, and and you know, I applaud that that is going to continue. Uh, I think too, if we look back to the the Great Depression, Australia actually recovered from the Great Depression. Uh, far better than most other economies around the world. We have the ability to do it. We, we've proved it in the past. We can do it. We just now need to ensure that we are engaging everybody in that economic recovery, not just some. That's really great. You guys have some really fascinating points. I wish I could just listen to you talk forever. But unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our discussion. Um, I am just going to ask one last quick question that has a few upvotes and I definitely relate. So I would love to hear your insights from you three. Um, so lots of people have been struggling, this question's from Tegan, with the blurred lines between our working lives and our home lives because of this situation. Um, are boundaries important and how do we successfully navigate uh, work and family roles when they're competing potentially more than ever right now? I can start on that. I think um, uh, the, plenty of research suggests that having some boundaries between work and life is really good for our well-being that um, being able to be in a workspace and really focus and get that sense of flow and engagement with our work um, makes us feel more like we're accomplishing something. And when we're with our family, certainly we all know that feeling of being with somebody and they're looking at their phone all the time or they're distracted and you don't get that sense of connection. And so for good well-being with our family, it's important to be able to completely focus on them for at least small bits of time. So I think it's important to use visual cues, you know, separate your workspace visually, have little rituals. Um, I know of somebody who gets on the exercise bike and rides it at least 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes before starting work in the morning, and that's her commute. And then once she gets off the bike, she goes and sits at the desk, and now she's at work. And, and that's a way for her to, to have a ritual that tells her when she's in this phase and when she's in this phase. This will obviously become easier once everything is not being done at home. So right now we do the best we can, but that will become, I think, easier and easier to do. And let me, I have lots to say on this topic, but I, I bet Madeline and Olivia have some really great insights, so I'll let them go. Well, I'm probably someone not to listen to right now because uh, Future Amp's in a bit of a growth period. And so in startups, there's a very blurred line between uh, when you're working and when you're not working. And even when it doesn't look like you're working, your brain's certainly working uh, on thinking about new ways to problem solve. Um, but with four kids, uh, and myself and, and my husband um, both working from home, it has been a complex and interesting time for us managing uh, what life and work looks like. Um, I think some advice uh, I would give that I probably need to take myself is, uh, is um, partly building on, on what you said, Jen, is that um, it's really important to create some sort of ritual or routine around the way that you structure your work. So there's a very clear indication to you, either physically or mentally, that you are commencing something. So there is that line there. I think another thing I do, and you can probably see in the background, I use a lot of Kanban style boards um, to sort of structure my task. I'm, a, I'm quite sort of task focused and that helps me be productive and stay uh, from getting distracted. Um, another thing I use, and some of you uh, would know, there's a great book called, I have a little pile here, it's called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And it's this idea of we all are constantly interrupted, whether that's by our children or our email or our WhatsApps, all the things and things that happen. And the idea of deep work is you carve out an incorruptible sort of uh, track of time which you will do effective thinking kind of work and, um, and be more productive. So I think 
sort of working out the way to structure your work and also into your energy flows is a great idea. If you're really good in the morning, then make that the time you do your power hours. Uh, and then if you've got to be with family or something else in the afternoon, then structure your day so that you really allow for uh, the ups and downs and ebbs and flows of your work. And from my perspective, uh, I, I'm a bit like Madeline. I'm not a great example and I don't have, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have um, children around anymore. I've got the dog that I have to worry about. But um, but for me, uh, I initially, being an extrovert, I initially found those early days really, really hard and I have to say I had really dark days where I, I really struggled and um, one or two days, I actually did, I, I told everybody at the agency I needed a mental health day because I wasn't in the right headspace for anybody and I took that and I was vocal about that. I let everybody know and I took those days and I went walking and I did things for myself because I, you know, I really struggled. I got more used to it as we, we entered on. One of the things that was important to me was I decided I need to try and work to Eastern Standards time, being based here in Perth, so I get up very early. But for me, the important thing was was putting my makeup on every day and making sure I look great from the waist up. So I might have my Ugg boots on or whatever uh, from the waist down, but I certainly always look professional from the waist up and I certainly have my makeup on because that made me feel like I was in work mode. The thing I struggle with now is making sure that I finish work uh, no later than 3 o'clock, which is when everybody else finishes, but by and large in the eastern states at the moment. And the other thing that i found with working from home is a lot of the incidental chats and decision-making that you have in the office place are no more, so I have to be far more planned, which is fine, except that I really have to make sure that I plan time where I do not have back-to-back -back -back meetings and commitments. Uh, because otherwise I get no think time, no reading time, uh, and that's really important. And here we are, what, it's 11.30 um, in Perth. I started at 7 o'clock this morning and I still haven't had anything to eat. You know, so you've got to look after yourself, and I say that from one who isn't particularly doing something like that, but we really have to take that time for ourselves. And, um, you know, and I'll leave in about 20 minutes and go and take the dog to the groomers. So that'll give me a bit of downtime. So it is a juggle, but we have to find a way that suits ourselves of, work, ourselves of working and, and everybody will be different. So talk to people, listen, try different things and tweak them to suit yourself. Fantastic. Well, I think that is a great note to end on. I think we probably need to wrap up so Libby can go and eat. <laughs> Um, I've got another meeting, Sophie. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for participating in this conversation. It's been so fascinating. I could honestly listen to you three talk for hours. Um, if you guys did enjoy this conversation, I'm encouraging you to check out the Women of the Business podcast, which has a lot of similar conversations to this. Um, you can find it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And actually, both Jen and Libby are guests who have appeared in recent episodes, so you should check it out. Um, before we close off proceedings, I would like to take a moment to thank a few of our um, young alumni committee members, uh, Lily Hodder, Doris Wu and Viv Petrov, and our alumni council members, Kate Stewart, Alison Conn, Cassandra Petrovsky and Antoinette Nido, who supported the alumni relations team today to shape the event. Uh, through committee and council, our volunteers are critical to bringing you a successful outreach program. And if any of you are interested in finding out more about these roles, please reach out to our alumni team after the event. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to farewell our panel now. And those of you who are keen to take part in our online networking session please stay on thanks thanks, so thanks everybody madeline jen bye great discussion thanks ladies thanks. Oh, it was a lot of fun <laughs>